So today I thought it would be fun to talk about um, the similarities and maybe the differences between art and science because I've spent my whole career in the science end of things but really when I was a little kid I wanted to be an artist. My mother told me that I'd starve to death if I did that and so <laughs> I was a fat little kid and I really liked to eat and so that that was really she really influenced me so I gave you know I, I gave it up got interested in first in baseball and then in girls and that and and that was the end of that you know so but I picked it up again um, later on in my life when I was approaching 65 and I thought I was going to have to retire, I thought to myself, well, you know, you better get something to do, Kendall. You're going to go stir crazy if you don't have something to do. And so I, I was living in New York at the time, Park Avenue and 88th Street. And right around the corner on 89th between Madison and 5th was the National Academy of Fine Arts. And I used to walk by it all the time on the way to the park. And I would read the signs and I knew that they had all these classes going on. And so... So I, so I enrolled in a class, in, in a life drawing class, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. But that started me off, this is maybe, I don't know, 15, even maybe even 20 years ago now. So I've been at it for a while, but uh, I, I don't really sell anything, although I, had a, I have had a couple of commissions so far. So anyway, the, you know, art and science are, are both very creative processes you know, in art, uh, if it's visual or performing arts or musical arts or whatever, you know, every time you, you do something, you're creating a new work that you put out into the world and um, other people learn from that and appreciate it and so forth because you, you're really, you're using your imagination to, to, to do these sorts of things. In science, it's also creative because you're trying to create new knowledge and using the existing knowledge that we all, that we have and, and and so forth and, and so that's a very very creative process and i'm going to go into that mostly because that's where i spent most of my time both of these things require a lot of time and effort to learn the craft of the, of the discipline whatever it is um and and usually the the, the different kinds of there are different kinds of techniques that are used that you apply to the to the problem or to the uh, endeavor, and it takes a long time. These these techniques and so forth, and, and media and all these things have, have evolved over, you know, uh, decades and years, years and decades, and even centuries, to the point where, and then become perfected and so forth. And it takes a while to pick up, pick all that stuff up. And science is no different. And I think I've said before in some of my other videos that science requires a lot of different skills on the part of the person that I'll get into. Uh, I, I thought one of the things that I could share with you that, that was interesting to me that I just learned about recently was one of my former technicians, um, Heidi Moss Erickson, um, is an opera singer. And her story was quite instructive in which, how she analyzed uh, learning these two different crafts because she, she came from a family with a lot of doctors and scientists and the different progeny, and it was a big Catholic family, so there are lots of people, and you know, a lot of uh, peer, peer pressure to do this or that and so forth. And of course, because they were all scientists and doctors and so forth, they valued that higher than anything else. But she had this innate talent of singing. She went to, she went to Oberlin College in Ohio, and that's one of my favorite colleges because my father went there. And so and he used to drag me to all the reunions. And so I've been there <laughs> so many times I can't, and I didn't want to go there after a while after, you know, because I, I already knew that. Anyway, she went to Oberlin because they have a very, very world-class and world uh, reputation conservatory of music. And so she went there and she did, and she double majored in biochemistry on the one hand and voice on the other hand, learning opera. When she graduated, uh, she graduated from Oberlin and then looked for a job in science. And I hired her right out of Oberlin as a um, technician in my lab. And she began, we, you know, taught her how to go about it, new techniques and so forth. And a lot of studying and reading about what we were actually doing and why we were doing what we were doing. And she spent several years with me, but then she went on to another lab <laughs> 
um, and then ultimately ended up in a laboratory just across the street at the Rockefeller University for several years. And she, she got, there was a fellow at the Rockefeller University who was studying the, um, the voice of canaries uh, and uh, how they created their sounds and so forth. I used to have a canary when I was at Dartmouth, uh, and he was really great. He would sing all day long and so forth. So I understood what this fellow was all about. And he, and he gave lectures at the Rockefeller. And so she became interested in, the, in voice and how you create those sounds from a scientific end of things uh, at the time that she was there. And then she, while she was uh, working in, in this laboratory, actually she had a first author paper in Cell, which is one of the very prestigious papers. She was working on telomeres in this laboratory and at the Rockefeller. While she was working in the lab, she was sort of moonlighting uh, and um, singing uh, all over New York City. On the west side, the Columbia had a, uh, also a big uh, emphasis on, on music and voice and so forth. And I went over there one night. We, we went to a to a um, bar nightclub kind of area where the reputation was that singers would congregate there and then they just you know you'd be sitting around talking to your friends and so forth, and one of them would get up and sing you know I, so I thought that was wonderful that was great and I really enjoyed it and I got to know more and more and more about opera we used to have um, well in, in our Christmas party we used to have Christmas parties and invited all of our friends from both uh, both the Sloan Kettering across the street and Rockefeller across the street and and have a big thing and I uh, because I knew that Heidi was was very gifted I would have her you know as people got a little bit oiled up and so forth I'd have her serenade us for a little while <laughs> it was a lot of fun she left she she was um, she competed in several uh, voice uh, competitions in the city and so forth and she she started moving up the ladder and people started noticing her and she was really she was on her way to to really hit the big time in opera, and she had a, the onset of a paralysis of her seventh cranial nerve, which which is the motor nerve for one whole side of her face. You can imagine that threw a monkey wrench in the whole voice end of things. Ultimately, she ended up in San Francisco. She was she before that was where she was, I guess, when she had this, and she was she was singing in San Francisco, and then not, all of a sudden she couldn't sing anymore. So that she started reading uh, in the neuroscientific literature all about you know what the scientists were saying about a voice and so forth, and of course she could read it and understand it, and you know and go go from there, which is not a, which is a pretty difficult thing to do if you're not a, if you're not, you know, bona fide card carrying scientist type, but she could do that because she'd spent almost a decade, I think. She ultimately, over, I don't know how long it took her, I'm going to have to ask her, but she taught herself to sing again with this paralysis. And of course, it probably goes down to the vocal cord on that side as well. So she taught herself to sing again and now, she, and she has videos online if you want to have, if you want to hear her sing, um, just, you know, plug in on YouTube of uh, Heidi uh, Moss Erickson and you'll find her and she, she's phenomenal uh, and so forth. Of course, now she's middle-aged and um, she recently uh, put a thing on, I think it was on Twitter or the Facebook, one of her, she's very active in the, on the social media end of things. And she pointed out that what you have to do in order to do either one of these things, either whether it's singing or whether it's science, you have to you have to really get down and focus on the on the nitty gritty of all the techniques and the kinds of things you're doing and so forth. And and she's teaching voice now to younger people, and she can probably do that better than anybody else because she knows how to make the sounds and why why the and how, you know, why you can make them that way which is what she's doing. And she said, you have to really get into, into the nitty gritty. You've got to learn, and it takes a time. It takes time to learn what you can do with your voice and how to um, you know, put the emphasis here and there and the emotions and all these different kinds of things into it. And it's the same way in science. You, you can't just pick up, you pick up the pipette in the lab, first day in the lab, you don't know which end to put in your mouth, you know? So in science, it, it, you have to really it takes at least a decade. So if you go to college and then graduate school and then postdocing, you you've already spent a decade in this whole business. And what, what you've been learning over that course of that time is you learn the history of what you're what you've been into, the, the subject um, that you're of interest, and you learn the techniques that you need to use 
in the laboratory, you know, the physical techniques, the manual techniques, the kinds of things, that, because it makes a big difference in how well you, you put something together. You can't just sort of schlock it here and there. You got to really think about it and you have to be taught and you have to practice just like in, in, in uh, singing, you, you have to practice and get it better and better and better and have somebody critique you as, as you're learning all these different kinds of things. So that's what it's about. And so as you accumulate these different techniques and, and you refine them and you become better and better and better at them, only then can you, can you become, be, become an individual who can apply all those different kinds of things and create something new, create something that nobody else has ever seen before on the one hand or ever heard about on the other hand, if it's science. That's, that's when you really get the mind rush, when you realize that, oh, look what I did. <laughs> so it's, a, it's very, very, it's, it's just great. And, and it really what it does, it creates a whole, um, that's all you wanna do because it's so much fun. And it's and you get such a uh, um, a good feeling out of the out of the accomplishment that what you're able to do. The other thing, and I've I've gone into this a little before, but I um, in in science um, and the different skills that you have to bring to the mix. This is one of the reasons that I really fixated on science once I found out what it was all about because it requires your total nature. Uh, you have to bring your total personality to the business. And one of them is, is that you, you need to, after you make your discovery and whatever it was in, in the lab, after all that time spent in the craftsmanship of, of doing experiments and analyzing them and changing a little bit here and a little bit there and adding other experiments in that would bolster the, the interpretation. So you do all those different kinds of things and you finally want to tell other people. And so in science, you really have to do, you have to be really comfortable with public speaking. And I think I t I've talked about this before. And when I first started to do it, I was, I was scared to death to <laughs> get up and talk. Now I really like it because I've mastered it over the years. And, and I, so I look forward to, to, to telling people about my whatever my science was at that particular point in time. And the other one, the other thing that you have to be able to do is, is to write. And you have to write creatively. You have to write persuasively. And the, the mantra that, or the mantra that um, I was taught with by, uh, by Maurice Landy was, is that you have to be concise, and this is scientific publishing, concise, tightly integrated, and persuasive. And then the persuasive is the most important part. And I said, you know, it's just like a lawyer arguing the case in court in the summary, for example, or it's like a business presentation when you stand up in front of you're giving a pitch, you, you're trying to persuade them to do buy your product or whatever it is. So it's exactly the same thing in science. And that's why I always said in, in, in science is much more difficult than medicine. In medicine, you're, you're, you, fit, you, you fit yourself into a, uh, into a hierarchy it's like putting the round peg in a round hole. Once you get into the hole, it's a piece of cake because everybody else knows what to do and how to do it, which brings me to the other skill that you have to have as a scientist. You have to be a good manager of people. And in order to do that, you really have to be interested in people. You can't be a nerdy, um, you know, nerdy science, science type. You got to be a people person because in each individual that I've come into contact with in the lab is that you have to psych them out and figure out what they're all about and what motivates them and, 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 and so forth. So all of those skills, in addition to the, in, in addition to the craft that you're doing are really, really important and whether or not you'll be able to be successful in science and be able to continue in science. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was, was my artistic happenings. As I said, I started about 15, 20 years ago at the National Academy of Fine Arts. And I, I started it essentially at the bottom. I, I enrolled myself in a life drawing class. And so um, every Monday night or whatever, once a week, I would go to, the, to my class. And it was simply charcoal on newsprint. And there would be a, a, a model, a nude model, and they would do funny poses and so forth. And what you had to do is, is that you had to really pay attention to the distances between, say, the wrist and the elbow. And if it's different if it's, if it's presented to you like this versus like that. Uh, and, and so 
the relative distances and the relative proportions of the sizes of the different parts of the body uh, are really important because it, otherwise it looks funny. <laughs> you could tell that that looks funny, you know, but you don't know exactly how to fix it necessarily. And so over the course, of, I took I did that for five years, taking these life drawing classes. My wife told me I just just wanted to go look at the naked ladies, which was true, you know. <laughs> But every now and then we'd have a male model, and I wasn't as interested in that one. But after a while, I got uh, I got sort of bored with that because I I thought that I had accomplished what I was supposed to be doing. And so then I, I enrolled for a couple of three years in another class because I needed to have you know that was just charcoal drawing on onto newspaper. So I enrolled in a class by a person who was a, was an expert in colored pencils. And and I didn't know anything about colored pencils, but basically they they're they're very much similar to crayons, and they um, they have that sort of um, you know, there's a couple of different kinds of colored pencils, but the ones I used uh, had a waxy uh, kind of thing, but they had the shape and the feel of a, of a regular pencil. And over the course of a couple of three years, I um, I really enjoyed pencil drawing because it was drawing, and so I could go, I went from the from the nude models to the drawing all kinds of things with with colored pencils and i learned color she taught us she was really a good teacher and she taught us about all the different colors and how to add you know red and blue and get whatever and so <laughs> and so forth um and that was very important because ultimately using the colored pencils was just like painting and you could you could influence the the the, the color the hue and and also the the value or the shading of the of the whole thing and she she taught us perspective she taught us light and shadows and so forth and that was really important for me I, and so then what happened to me is is that I, I left new york and i came down to sarasota florida and i enrolled in a class in um, the arts center of sarasota and i met a, a teacher her name is Nancy Goff, and um, she'd been teaching at the Art Center for several years, actually. It turns out she used pastel, and so I, I thought to myself, well, that's, I was a little bit, of, I was afraid to try um, paint, I, because I already knew that this is not an easy medium to work on. But uh, pastel seemed to me, it was sort of a trade-off. It was a little bit like chalk, or like charcoal, a little bit like colored pencils, and maybe I could do that. And so I started off on a, on a still life class, and then um, I can't remember what, what else we did, landscaping, a little bit of landscapes. And then, and then she, also, she taught a course in, in portraits. And I'd al always wanted to do portraits because I figured that this was the most difficult thing to do. And if I can do that, I could do anything, really. So I enrolled in her course in portraits. And you can see behind me, this is a, this is a um, portrait of my mother and father um, from a photo um, that was taken at, at the time of their wedding in 1937. And uh, I've had a lot of fun then blowing up family photos from tiny little ones to make them really big. <laughs> so, and, but the thing is, you know, I, I know that if I wanted to really progress in art, I, I needed, I needed to, I would need to learn all these different media because I never could become, I don't think, really creative until, until I used all the, all the different kinds of things into a, into a situation that I might find myself. But I'm an old geezer at this stage. And so I figured that, you know, this is enough. I'm just going to stick with pastel. But it gives you an idea of what I think, you know, in order to become an artist in this day and age, and, you know, you, you have to really spend some time learning all these different methods and techniques and, and, and also learning from different people, different teachers. And one of the reasons that I stuck, I, so I stuck with Nancy Goff. I've been taking private lessons from her for, I don't know, more than five, six, seven years. And every week I go to her place and, and um, she critiques what I'm doing and, <laughs> It tells me, tells me what I should change and so forth. And, and she always adds. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. What she, she can look at it for 30 seconds and pinpoint exactly what problems <clears throat> that I've been having, and then we fix it. And one of the other things I really liked about her was, is that, you know, and they, well, once the, the thing is, is that when, when I came down here and find her, found her, one of the things I really liked about her was in the class situation, it'd be half a dozen students and their easels and they'd all be looking at whatever it is, it's still life or whatever. 
and she'd come around to your uh, and look at your painting and she would take the, the pastel from your hand and then and work on your thing. But it was, I liked, I thought that was great because it looked better after she did that than, than what I was doing. And I knew from, because I'd had all these other teachers up in New York, I had several teachers up there. And you know, I, I was taking beginning courses and I think they were probably bored with most of it. And I didn't get very much individual instruction. But when I found Nancy, I realized that this is, this is good. And if you're going to try to learn anything new, it really helps to have a fantastic teacher. And so she's one of them. And, uh, and so I feel really fortunate and lucky at this stage of the game. And so I'll, I'll stop there and um, just throw that out there for you people that might want to become scientists or artists, um, pursue your craft. Thank you. So if you've enjoyed this video, um, please like, subscribe, and sign up for my newsletter, uh, where I'm serializing my new book, which is called The, the Quest for New Knowledge. You'll find a sign-up link below. Hey, thanks again. It's been great.